the unicorn lived in a lilac wood, and she lived all alone. Hello, and welcome to the Bomb Squad podcast. I'm Ethan, last of the Red Hot Swamis Hawker, and with me I have... Hi, I'm Austin Sweebelman. Hi, I'm Tim M. Sullivan, brought to you by Red Bull. <laughs> Very appropriate, <laughs> considering today's subject is Rankin Bass and Studio Topcraft's 1982 adaptation of Peter S. Beagle's much beloved fantasy novel, The Last Unicorn. I'm really excited about this one. This is an absolute favorite film, sort of jumping the gun and uh, really thrilled to talk about a little bit of Rankin Bass, a little bit of Peter S. Beagle, who's just a fabulous dude. Um, and let's jump right in. Kind of a big question. What's your overall history with Rankin Bass and uh, more specifically The Last Unicorn? And what were your expectations going in? Tim, would you like to start us off? Sure. Uh, so for starters, I want to just talk about just a little aside. Earlier this year, there was a video that I saw on YouTube that uh, was titled Every Day Since the Day I Turned 28. And it's just the clip of the last unicorn where the unicorn is turned into a human and she's going, I can feel this body dying all around me. <laughs> this clip was posted on my 29th birthday. So I feel that this was a personal attack to me specifically. Oh, absolutely. No debate. <laughs> but yeah, um, my history with uh, Rankin Bass as a whole, probably not too different from really anybody else's. I mean, we all watched the Christmas specials as kids. Happy birthday! <gasps> Three hours later. I can feel this body die! Rudolph and Frosty, pretty much any time they would come on, I would be watching those. The one that we owned, though, when I was a kid, we had uh, the VHS copy of Santa Claus is Coming to Town, which I think is probably a less popular one than those two. No, no, it's the one with Twink Santa. Yeah, exactly. It's the, it's the um, good one. It's the one with Twink Santa. Twink Santa. Uh, that one I've always enjoyed because, you know, that's the one that I was able to watch whenever I wanted to because we had it on VHS. So I just popped it in whenever I was feeling for some Santa Claus is coming to town. You got your, your Burger Meister Meister Burger, which is the greatest name of any villain in fiction. And uh, like you were saying, you got you got Twink Santa, which uh, I, the one thing that's always been very funny about that to me is that... Uh, when I grow my hair and beard out just right, I kind uh, of look like the young Santa. Oh, cool. absolutely. Yeah, like I pretty much enjoy all of the stuff from them that I've seen. Like I watched the Rankin Bass Hobbit movie on a plane a few years ago and I dug it. Yes, indeed. There are moon letters here. Like, I, I think it's a better encapsulation of the Hobbit story than the trilogy. And it also didn't make Suri and McKellen cry on set, so it's definitively the better movie. Because you don't f*** with Ian McKellen. He's a good man. I saw this movie, I think, a year or two ago. It was just something that I watched as I was just, like, looking at animated films on stream platforms. I think it might have been on Netflix or something, and I know I had heard about it, so I threw it on, and I remembered enjoying it at the time, and I was excited to revisit it. So that's, that's about all I got. Back to you, Ethan. Yeah, I think that's fair, particularly um, getting into it with the uh, Christmas specials, as with most people, that's, that's usually their first exposure and their stop motion. <laughs> Their cell animation w would show every once in a while. There was, um, the, the Frosty, obviously, is the big one. It obviously stands out less prominently to folks than, you know, Rudolph and that particular sort of uh, simplistic stop-motion stuff. But it's it's pretty interesting. Um, and their fantasy fair has a particularly large place in the hearts of people of a particular age, nerds of a particular age, where it's kind of kitschy and silly for the most part, uh, the, the non-Last Unicorn entries, if I'm being honest, but... Yes, just a dagger, actually, but for one of my size, it suffices. They're all very charming, even when they're bad, like The Return of the King. Um, <laughs> but Austin, uh, what's your history with ranking Bass, uh, The Last Unicorn, and what were your expectations going in? They should have called the studio Crankin' Bass because they were cranking out holiday movies like it was hotcakes on a Friday night special. Admittedly, uh, I only ever thought of Rankin' Bass when it came to those claymation films. Every single year of my childhood, I ended up watching either Frosty or Rudolph. 
And uh, since this is being published as a way of fishing for familiar company, I'd like to formally admit here without a Santa Claus absolutely frightened the shit out of me as a child. <laughs> Something about the heat miser? I can't quite remember. But the knowledge that they've made 2D stuff is a recent discovery from, like, researching this podcast. I'd forgotten their Lord of the Rings adaptations because Ralph Bakshi's film overshadowed them so thoroughly, and never in my life had I paid any serious attention to The Last Unicorn. As for expectations for this movie, uh, the general reputation it seems to have is that it makes people profoundly upset. I had heard from Ethan and some video essays that it's a heavy film, so my first viewing of this was very tense. I imagined every possible way that this could end tragically and teared up at various points in anticipation of what was about to maybe happen. But whether or not that impression was fully accurate will have to be said during the next question. For sure. Um, that was sort of their bread and butter was the, the Christmas animation because with Christmas animation, it airs pretty consistently and you get royalties every year whenever it airs. So it's usually worth the investment. That's a Chuck Jones-ism that he would preach because uh, a lot of his money came from the Grinch every year. Mr. Where are we going? You're going to stay with me, and we'll all be rich! I think particularly uh, with regards to expectations, I feel almost bad about that, because I do kind of think about The Last Unicorn as that movie, What Makes Me Cry. Uh, but it's also so funny and delightful. Like, it's it's such a treat on so many levels that I, I feel like just it being the movie that makes me cry like a big old baby is, is kind of secondary to that. <laughs> but getting into my own history with uh, Rankin Bass and with this film, uh, like everybody, basically, my introduction to Rankin Bass was through their uh, stop motion animated uh, puppet films, particularly the Christmas stuff, barring, you know, like Frosty. And I think I might have seen The Mouse and the Mayflower when I was younger, too, as part of a school thing for Thanksgiving. But it was mostly that stop motion stuff. And I, I remember particularly, uh, funnily enough, The Year Without Santa Claus was one of my favorites, specifically because I really liked the Heat Miser and the um, uh, Snow Miser musical numbers. Despite the fact that they're just the same thing, they just did the same thing again, but switched out a couple lyrics. Good on them for reusing that instrumentation. I worked uh, Santa photography at the mall last season, and my god, that song, over and over and over. Oh, as a kid, loved it. But yeah, it's a repetitive in and of itself. I can't imagine it just on loop. But eventually, you know, I got into animation and it was through, um, you know, Ralph Bakshi's Lord of the Rings uh, that I uh, looked into like their fantasy animation, The Hobbit, which I still have a lot of affection for. It's not perfect, but it's a lot of fun. And there's some lovely little musical numbers in it. Uh, the Return of the King, which is bad, very, very bad. But I really like the design of Eowyn in it and Ottergorn. Uh, there's some good design work there. And uh, where there was a whip, there's a way. Good track. Flight of Dragons is all right. Clearly Topcraft was busy because it came out, you know, the summer of 1982. They were busy with another project of more significance, which is The Last Unicorn, which is, you know, one of those films I really fell in love with sort of upon seeing it. It's part of the great canon of animated unicorn films that came out in 1981, 82, 83. It's sandwiched between the also extremely good, surprisingly kind of dark Unico films uh, that came out of uh, Sanrio, the Hello Kitty guys that made these wonderfully lush animated features. But The Last Unicorn is maybe a bit more whimsical, a bit more authentically magical than them. I kind of expected it to be better than like The Hobbit and that sort of thing, but not by a wide margin. Um, I thought it would be like a lot more polished because it's feature animation and not a, not a television special, that sort of thing, um, which leads us to, of course, our overall thoughts on the film as a whole. Tim, do you want to lead us off here? Movie good. Yes, movie good. You love movie good. But yeah, the revisiting it, I think I enjoyed it a little bit more than I did whenever I first watched it. There's a lot to like about it, like going into it and seeing that it's rated G and then experiencing the movie is like such a <laughs> crazy whiplash. <laughs> like there's so much violence and talk about death and there's a harpy with three titties. Like there's some swearing and I'm just like, how is this rated G in 1982? Like there's some crazy PG movies in the 80s, but like, damn, this one is a heavy hitter. 
Oh, she'll kill me one day or another, but she will remember forever that I caught her. So there's my immortality, eh? <laughs> I think the character of the unicorn is sympathetic. Like, you, you see her going through so much. Like, she's, you know, the last of her kind. And then uh, suddenly she's transformed into a human. And she, again, she feels her body dying. And slowly starts to, you know, grip with mortality. Like, it, it deals with a lot of heavy stuff, like heavier than you would expect from an animated movie that, uh, you know, seems to be predominantly aimed at children. But yeah, it's just, it's a movie I think you can enjoy at any age with an open mindset. And I'm sure it's probably a movie that I'll enjoy even more on further viewings, because <laughs> you pay attention to it more the more you watch it. Um, and got some great performances by uh, Jeff Bridges and Christopher Lee. Always love hearing Christopher Lee in animated stuff, much like uh, another Sanrio uh, film, The Nutcracker Fantasy, <laughs> which is f***ing wild. That's all I've got for this one, so I'm going to give it back to you, Ethan. Nutcracker Fantasy rocks. It's like the same sort of stop motion as a Rankin Bass animated film, but with like feature budget. Ooh, uh, a real good time. It's Rankin Bass meets house. He's precious. Can I have it? No, 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 no. Not this doll. Particularly not this doll. Yeah, if, if you want a Christmas house, then that's <laughs> about as close as you're going to get. Yeah, and particularly, I think, when you talk about the unicorn slash Lady Malthea saying, I can feel my body dying around me, uh, that's sort of like part of the larger theming of the film in, in a nutshell. I think it's really appropriate that we're discussing this just a couple weeks after discussing It's Such a Beautiful Day, because, you know, those are two films that in very different fashion explore human entropy in a really mature, kind of distinct way, obviously. Just that element alone sort of immediately establishes how different The Last Unicorn is from contemporary like children's animation, let alone, you know, like just film in general. Don't let him change me. The Red Bull has no care for human beings. If we do that, all of the unicorns of the world will remain prisoners forever except one, and she will grow old and die. Everything dies. Tolkien was doing different things in the adaptations of his works that sort of informed a lot of animated fantasy fare of the day, kind of led towards like cultural anthropologies and that sort of thing, and less of this very humanistic, wonderful quality that permeates Beagle's work. And I'm, oh, I love it. I love it so much. It's so good. Um, Austin, overall thoughts on the film? They should have called this movie My Special Pony, Schmendrick is Magic. Uh. <laughs> There's that uh, that camp of like weird looking 80s cartoons that were like deeply unsettling compared to that friendly type of product Americans expected in the massive shadow of Disney movies. You've got your Secret of Nim, Watership Down, The Black Cauldron to an extent, even though they neutered my boy. <laughs> it seems to me like they're often adaptations of books. And uh, like there's this huge disconnect between what kids feel safe reading about and what kids feel safe watching on screen. I have long held the belief that there's this vague sort of like literary quality when a movie screenplay is more like a book that kind of elevates the art form into something really special. And it's no huge surprise that The Last Unicorn, a movie where the author got to write the screenplay, carries this mark of distinction. Each time I see the unicorns, it is like that morning in the woods, and I am truly young in spite of myself. There's this fascinating trend where the characters in this movie carry a deep pain that can help viewers reflect on the nature of life itself. Like there's a magician whose only real desire is to wield a power that creates great and confusing consequences. Or like a woman who feels like a shell of her former self and finds exactly what she was looking for too late in life. Or a king that becomes unhappy no matter what he tries and only finds happiness when he steals something the world badly needs. It's just a remarkable story that feels like a, a real new fairy tale, even it's in spite of its like metafiction and its anachronisms. Even though those are things that restrict stuff like Shrek or Into the Woods from feeling like the genuine article, but not this. And it's so delightful to have a beautiful movie about unicorns come from the same production company that helped kids meet Rudolph and Frosty. 
those magical things that we like believed in as children, like they could be real somewhere far away. Stay where you are, poor beast. This is no world for you. Stay in your forest and keep your trees green and your friends protected. Famous fairy tales like Santa or unicorns, they make for excellent films, but the hard part is making a movie good enough to come across as an actual legend. So I guess in conclusion, I think The Last Unicorn is incredible, mostly for its storytelling alone, but the other elements of production are good enough to keep this whole thing entertaining as a movie. Whether or not it's suitable for kids kind of depends on the kid, but but I think for adults, it may help you discover a bit of your inner child. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I think the film is, uh, it's maybe a little tired to refer to a film as magical, but when you're, you describe The Last Unicorn as such, it's in the real truest sort of core sense. It feels like a modern sort of myth um, and Beagle really captures that perfectly. Um, the fact that he was so heavily involved in the production <laughs> certainly helps. Um, though by all accounts, um, Arthur Rankin, I believe, encouraged him very directly keep bits from the book in the movie. Like, don't cut too much stuff, because we like this. This is why we're adapting this. Which is nice to hear. I know you. If I were blind, I would know what you are. Who are you? I entertain the sightseers as they gather for the show. It's not much of a job for a real magician, but I've had worse. Yeah, it definitely feels like there's less of the sort of stuff trimmed that you would need for adapting a Tolkien. And even, you know, as I love the novel, you don't lose all that much from the source text. Like, you, you have a bit more insight and, of course, some fantastic lines. Just really great writing from Beagle in general. Do you really know what she is? If you had been waiting to see a unicorn as long as I have, it all comes together into this really delightful, singular sort of picture. My own thoughts, um, sort of getting into it, I think it's incredible. Um, I think it's <laughs> one of the uh, most spectacularly realized animated films. It's one of those rare animated films where I think um, the animation and design work on display is like terrific. Um, and I'll get into that more, but I don't feel like that needs to carry it for me. Like the layouts can be a bit more simple. Things can be a bit more plain, but just everything comes together in such a fabulous way from the narrative to the wonderful voice acting uh, Jeff Bridges who apparently begged to be on this film who really really wanted it and puts in a fabulous performance as uh, Prince Lear <laughs> to be King Lear purportedly unintentional by Beagle I, I, I will not trouble you my lord prince oh, trouble me please trouble me Alan Arkin's Schmendrick. Perfect performance. We love a shitty wizard. A shitty wizard is one of my favorite archetypes in fiction, period. I'm a big Discworld fan, so Rincewind lives in my heart. Mia Farrow's Unicorn slash Lady Malthea, wonderful. Tammy Grimes as Molly Grew makes me cry. That scene where she sees the unicorn for the first time and you hear her breath catch in her throat. Where have you been? And where were you 20 years ago? Where were you when I was new? When I was one of those innocent young maidens you always come to? How dare you come to me now when I am this? And, oh, pulling a tanner here. Um, <laughs> crying on cast. Um, <laughs> but when she breaks down it's such a perfect performance and it's something you could not get from another children's film you know a woman in middle age sort of past the prime of her youth having this breakdown but who is still ultimately a strong character she's just allowed this moment of vulnerability for an older woman that you just you don't see that in films in general uh, and it's really incredible everything here comes together the music too gosh is as literal as it sometimes can be uh, is so perfect it's the time when the folk music thing that sort of persists in a lot of Rankin Bass's fantasy adaptations really comes together and doesn't feel quite so kitsch as it does in their other works. Even Mia Farrow's vocalizations I quite like and have grown on me a lot over the years. But that's going to be the overall thoughts, and I'm sure we'll dive into some specifics as we go on. But I did want to lead into another question. Uh, the thoughts 
on the film's visuals. And I know that's sort of contradicting what I said earlier about how this film doesn't need to be super visually driven, but I think it is important to spotlight that all of Rankin Bass's work was outsourced to Japan, to a variety of different studios. And uh, this film's animation was uh, outsourced to uh, Studio Topcraft, as were all their fantasy animated films. And uh, Studio Topcraft being uh, founded by Toru Hara, uh, who worked at Toei Animation, one of his last projects there actually was on Isa Takahata's debut feature, Horus, Prince of the Sun, which all comes back together because Topcraft was founded largely to do outsourcing work, and The Last Unicorn, this spectacular, wonderful film, would lead to uh, big things and a return to Isao Takahata later on. But I'll discuss that when it's my turn. Tim, thoughts on the film's visuals? Yeah, I mean, I think it, it looks great. Out of the things I've seen from Rankin Bass, easily the best looking film I've seen from them. I think I've been made to understand that cells of this film are like particularly rare because, I mean, yeah, they're, they're very gorgeous and, you know, sought after. And I think I've also heard that a lot of them have that vinegar syndrome where they get damaged a lot. But man, I can definitely understand wanting a piece of this film in your home because yeah, every frame of it just looks incredible. I don't have anything real specific to say about it. Like it just, it looks very good. Yeah, I think that's completely fair. And yeah, considering what would sort of happen to Topcraft shortly after, it, it does track that the uh, cells were especially ill-preserved, as it were. But it looks very distinctive, even amongst their catalog, and has, has a very singular sort of look. But Austin, your thoughts on the film's visuals? This was a pretty tight production, made for about $3.5 million, which isn't much when you consider something like The Secret of Nim cost $7 million to make, and The Black Cauldron cost $44 million dollars these were the tv holiday special guys known for outsourcing animation right it was really something to see multi-plane animation at the beginning of a rank and bass feature <laughs> or uh the scene of the bull chasing the last unicorn animated gloriously on ones or uh, one thing that's pointed out on the Blu-ray commentary uh, was that there's a bit a detail in King Haggard's castle. There's little demons in the background uh, in the woodworking until Lady Amalfia shows up. Then unicorns start to appear in the woodwork. It's kind of cool and uh, apparently was a thing the animators decided on. But there were other things that weren't as spectacular as they could have been. The unicorn itself moves in a very weird way, constantly kind of bobbing and fidgeting around at times. Or the Extras during the Mommy Fortuna scene are very goofy looking <laughs> in a couple of shots. Oh, and the scene where the farmer falls near the beginning when he tries to, you know, grab the white mare that's a unicorn. Uh, there's a scene where he falls and it just looks very half done. Come on, horse. A horse, am I? A horse, indeed. But um, it wouldn't be an 80s animated movie without a bunch of imperfections. I don't know if this would be the same movie if it looked like Akira. Uh, that weird low budget look sort of complements the more mature existential character moments. Yeah, I totally agree. There are definitely some elements, I, uh, partially that are derived from layouts. I'll cut the animators a certain amount of slack, sort of the, um, with, with regards to the animation of the unicorn. It is a bit clunky at times, but her moving kind of unnaturally is not awful, all things considered. I mean, she's a bit different from a regular horse, uh, but more than anything, um, it's that animating a horse is sort of just the ultimate move of an animator. Like, if you can animate a horse, you know you've made it. Like, they got four legs, they move all funny. Edward Moybridge <laughs> photographed horses specifically because their movements are so <laughs> uh, and they're hard to understand. Uh, we weren't sure if all their feet left the ground at one time. Um, oh yeah, the Moybridge <laughs> photographs were for him to win a bet whether or not all their feet left the ground. <laughs> exactly. Horses oh, are freaks and they move all weird. But um, no, I, I do agree that there are there are some idiosyncrasies, some odd bits and bobs, and uh, both the animation and the larger visual design. But I still have a lot of affection for it. It, it feels like there's a bit more editing going going on on Topcraft's part. They aren't adhering so closely to Lester Abrams' original character designs. There's uh, some, some confusion about this too. Um, there was a poster set that was made by a company that basically immediately went out of business because they were bad. Like they cheated a bunch of people out of money and they didn't commit to all their completed prints. That was a big thing. But um, as part of it, they had prints of um, 
the original character lineups for this film, and they ascribed them who, to Hidemi Kubo, um, who was a key animator on the film. And that's probably wrong. Um, in, in an interview on the Blu-ray, it's ascribed to uh, Sugiyuki Kubo, who did continuity animation, um, which is a far more likely position for someone who would, you know, edit the character designs for a piece. Uh, that's sort of in the granular realm of trivia, but I want to ascribe appropriate credit um, to uh, Sugiyuki Kubo for his work because I think he does a good job of editing, particularly uh, Amalthea's design. He gives her a longer face uh, than Lester's designs. Uh, the Lester's designs are kind of um, nymph-like, uh, like pixie-like in a way that is feels magical but doesn't really complement her character. Um, and I, I love Amalthea's the design work on her in particular. Uh, she looks really good according to um, I, I want to say it was Arthur Rankin again. The edited design that uh, Kubo produced, like the initial concept he did, is not too dissimilar to um, Abrams's, but she has her out. Um, and so he described her as looking like an Asian whore. No! <laughs> Which, not great, not a great look. Um, I think in the finished picture, she looks real, real good. Um, Schmendrick as well is a very good design. I love the movement of fabrics and he's got a lot big loose outfit, which is very much complements his bumbling. I Schmendrick the magician forbid it and be wary of rousing a wizard's wrath. Rousing a wizard's, be wary of making a, a magician angry. And the Red Bull, uh, again, ascribing appropriate credit to Topcraft. This uh, Red Bull in particular was uh, supposedly a Japanese design, as was the Harpy, that there was no real line art produced um, by Abrams for either the Red Bull or the Harpy. And I think uh, both of those designs are wonderful. I think Peter S. Beagle in the commentary says he doesn't love the, the Harpy design because he thinks it looks a little funky. He also doesn't love the, the design on the fur, the tree. He calls it vulgar. God, he's, he's such a goof, though, too. I can't be mad at him because he just he immediately follows it up with, I don't know, this all just happened to me. Like, he just kind of stumbled into this fabulous story. And I, I appreciate that level of guile, understanding of how art is made, basically, that sometimes you just stumble into a, a earth shattering masterpiece that will change countless people's lives for the better. <laughs> There's an effect they use for the line art, where frequently they use colored line art, like Schmendrick has uh, brown line art on his hair. I like that's a deeper brown than his actual hair. Lady Malthea frequently uses, you know, like white and blue. Um, that always adds to just the overall ethereal quality of animation. It's a it's a hard trick to do. Uh, it's a bit more work, but I love it and it's super good. And apparently other people thought this movie was real good um, because in uh, 1983, after this production wrapped, they were approached to work on an adaptation of Hayao Miyazaki's manga, Noshika of the Valley of the Wind, um, and would also get work on another film that we've covered here on the Bomb Squad podcast, Macross, Do You Remember Love, doing animation work um, on those two productions. <laughs> animation work that was so good that they would go bankrupt. <laughs> but Around half the staff remained, uh, and they would be purchased by uh, Toshio Suzuki, uh, Isa Takahara, and Hayao Miyazaki, and would be reborn as Studio Ghibli, the animation company behind countless other magical fairy tales that have changed people's lives for the better. Which is a kind of cool story, um, bankruptcy aside. They went from The Last Unicorn, which kind of fits into the uh, Ghibli canon as a whole. But that's the end of visual discussion. We're going to take a quick ad break, and then we'll be right back to generally discuss this picture. I'm waving, you just can't see it. <laughs> she truly was the last unicorn. We're back back to discuss The Last Unicorn, generally. I'm going to just lead us off by, um, this is kind of a trivia -y thing, but I wanna, wanna address the Bakshi-shaped elephant in this room, uh, and that's Peter S. Beagle wrote a movie before this, and it was 1978's The Lord of the Rings, which apparently he was not happy with, by all counts. He also was not happy with all of Rankin Bass's output before this film. He said he hated it, <laughs> which I love, just that candor. He also wasn't happy with uh, the fact that America was doing some of the songs in this movie. America, a band that I know for Sister Golden Hair, and more famously, A Horse With No Name. He hated the, the band because I think it was his daughter had overplayed horse with no name in their house 
And so he was like, man, f America, this is Nickelback. Oh, yeah, I love that, too, because um, he knew Jimmy Webb was working on it. The composer for the film, um, famous for, you know, the Highwayman in particular. But he didn't know that America would be the one actually performing the, the vocal <laughs> soundtrack. Um, so he, he very much says, like, I'm very glad I didn't know because I hated that god awful horse with no name. I was terrified to learn that the score was going to be sung by America because at that time I hated America deeply and profoundly. But uh, Jimmy Webb, by all accounts, loved the experience and uh, purportedly said that uh, the score for this film opened my work up to a whole new audience of seven-year-old girls. Which, Hell yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, get them while they're young, make them lifelong fans. At one point, ABBA was actually considered to do the soundtrack for this film, uh, which would have been very different, but delightful in its own way. Um, wouldn't have quite fit with the sort of folksy whole of the thing. I was wondering about Lady Amalthea's name, because that's just one of those words where you're like, man, that means something shit. And I think it's like, you know, one of Jupiter's moons, but the actual place that it comes from is, there's this legend of, I think, a goat who guarded Zeus from his dad on some island. And when Zeus got roided with God's strength later in his life, he accidentally done broke off one of the goat's horns and made the first unicorn. I love that too, Hell because yeah. Beagle specifically says he didn't that know. he completely he completely forgot about it. Like it was just buried <laughs> in his subconscious. He's, he's very humble about his uh, his work, um, which makes him all the more charming. Oh, uh, returning to the soundtrack too, um, we kind of have to address the the Mia Farrow shaped elephant in this room. Lots of elephants in this room. A veritable Mommy Fortuna's circus of elephants. Mia Farrow's voice on the uh, track "Now That I'm a Woman." It was not supposed to be her voice, but it was uh, supposed to be Katie. Irving, a session singer, um, and it just wasn't correctly put in. Um, on the soundtrack release for the film, uh, it is Katie Irving's voice, and it is a, a sweeter sounding song, but I don't know, Mia Farrow's kind of wilting voice you know, kind of compliments her being Lady Amalthea, the human form of the unicorn, someone who wouldn't have much vocal control or anything. You can still hear Katie Irving in the film singing on the track with um, Jeff Bridges, which uh, is a bit better. Uh, Jeff Bridges similarly sounds a little rough, but that perfectly complements what he's going for. And I tried to write a symphony, but I lost the melody. This movie did Adventure Time before Adventure Time happened in so many ways. The unicorn and the bad singing, they just nailed it. <laughs> this movie burned Rebecca Sugar. She was conceived while her parents are watching this. I, I would not be shocked if, yeah, I feel like Re Rebecca Sugar's probably a fan of this. It seems up rally. Apparently, um, I think Peter S. Beagle's uh, cousin married a Spanish painter, and that painter made like, you know, a, a work of art where there was a red bull charging a unicorn, and that could have been one of the places that he got the idea for that from. Kind of like how the whole thing with unicorns in him came from him going to a museum in New York to look at tapestries of unicorns as, ki as a kid. It's a wonderfully impressionistic sort of painting too, um, which, you know, again, sort of slots into this, the overall magical nature of everything. Magical is the descriptor of the day. It's the adjective to which uh, you kind of are obliged to apply. I do w want to point out Mommy Fortuna's circus, despite, like it's a delightful sequence in the film, just the interactions between Rook as he's leading the carnival goers around and introducing them to all the animals. Here is the dragon breathes fire now and then, mostly at people who poke it, little boy. The juxtaposition between their appearances and everything, like it, it again hits all of that great balance of comic beats, introducing us to the strange way magic functions in this world, characterizing Schmendrick and the unicorn. Everything is into the service of this film's incredible tone, um, which is great. Uh, but the one thing that is missing from the film version is probably my favorite line from the book, period, which is from Schmendrick as he's battling Rook and he starts threatening him with a series of curses. You pile of stones, you 
waste, you desolation. I'll stuff you with misery till it comes out of your eyes. I'll change your heart into green grass and all you love into sheep. I'll turn you into a bad poet with dreams. Um, that last line, I'll turn you into a bad poet with dreams, uh, is just firmly embedded in my brain. This is one of those endlessly quotable sort of films, one of those endlessly quotable sort of novels, and just a fantastic uh, piece of writing uh, from, from Beagle. I adore it. Rat soup. Again, rat soup. At least she could use a different rat the third night anyway. The cat. We've not discussed the pirate cat. Who has an eye patch, even though its eye is fine under the eye patch. Why won't you help me? Why must you always speak in riddles? Because I be what I be. And no cat anywhere ever gave anyone a straight answer. <laughs> Amongst other things, despite uh, being you know, very funny, the cat appears at the end of the film. The cat survives the destruction of Haggard's fortress. At the very end, as uh, Molly is climbing onto her horse, you see the cat um, just barely past her, and there's a lump under her the back of her dress as she gets on, and it is the cat um, who Yay. thankfully survives. You love to see it. Script writing 101, let the cat live. The, another a great performance that we didn't get to talk about too, um, and I'll bring it up briefly is, um, just because it's such a great little sequence, is uh, Rene Aubert Bejanois as the skeleton uh, who they confront before going to battle the Red Bull and before um, Hager learns for sure that the unicorn is a unicorn. Um, I love that performance by Aubejanois. Uh, I think the skeleton's a lot of fun. Um, I like that it, the skeleton gets flushed cheeks. Felt something in my heart when the skeleton said, But you're dead! You can't smell wine, can't taste it. But I remember something about that it's a very hammy skeleton really just like taking the role for what it's worth and then there's this one line that just kind of hits yeah it seems like every single character just has at least that one line that really grounds and humanizes them in such a wonderful way barring maybe Hagar and even him uh, there's something about his just violent apathy that's kind of <laughs> that makes you pity him on some level and I think that's that's wonderful. That's wonderful that I can feel feel bad for this horrible man. <laughs> what are you looking at? The sea. Ah, yes. There is nothing that I can look at for very long, except the sea. The butterfly made me worried I wasn't going to like this movie because of how long the butterfly sequence goes on. Also, I, I wasn't in the mode yet because the film had just began to consider something as complicated as like, oh, these are a bunch of old songs and quotes from Cyrano de Bergenac and all this, this pastiche of shit that the butterfly is doing. <laughs> and so I was just like, oh, Lord, what's going to happen now? But it's you, you appreciate it more the, the more times you watch the butterfly scene as you slowly piece together where all those uh, things the butterfly says are from. It, I was kind of surprised at how long it ran when I revisited it, too. Uh, it, it catches you off guard, but it's sort of, I don't know, the, the Tom Bombadil moment of the film. If we're going to make this analogous to, to Tolkien, where it's just like, where did that come from? But it does integrate, I think, a little bit better with the overall tone. It's so because, you know, the whole film is sort of playful, even when it can be very dire. If you know my name, Tell it to me. Your name is a golden bell hung in my heart. Say it if you know. Rumpelstiltskin, gotcha. And I like that it establishes that. I know, I believe, um, Beagle has stated that the, the butterfly is sort of an author surrogate on some, in some capacity, and that his design was slightly based on him at the time. I like that he makes himself the annoying butterfly. <laughs> and apparently, uh, Beagle has told translators, just do your own thing, because it would never translate into another language. Hooray for Hudson High and all those various references. It's just like, do your own thing. Do your Polish version of that. Oh, speaking of foreign languages, um, it's worth noting that this this film sort of bombed in the U.S. Like, you, it was supposed to be distributed by Universal initially before it was passed off to um, Jensen Farley, uh, which was a tiny little distribution studio, like a, just a real nothing burger s distribution studio out of, I think, maybe like Utah or something. And by all accounts, it did very well briefly before the company went out of business 17 days after it uh, premiered. Um, so there there were reports that people kept running the film, like theaters kept running the film, but they didn't have a distributor they needed to pay. Um, so the actual 
box office of the film is a contentious subject, but the film did find a second wind when it was distributed in Germany. It was a huge, huge hit over there. Uh, that's where the best uh, official soundtrack album was ever released. Toys, plush, all that. Like they brought the cast and Beagle and all the production team over there. Like it was just a huge success. And it's really nice to get to hear that it had such a, a big second wind because it deserves it. It's a good movie. <laughs> it's a real good movie. Then I think we can jump directly to our final thoughts on the film. Tim, do you want to lead us out here? I want to hear more from you. Yeah, I mean, I, I enjoyed the movie. I enjoyed it more, I think, this time than whenever I had watched it previously. Uh, it's definitely worth checking out. If you haven't seen it, be you boy, girl, or anything in between. Uh, it's just it's just fun for anybody. It's a universally appealing sort of film. Austin, final thoughts on the film? I will remember this movie in my heart when men are fairy tales and books are written by rabbits. Well said. <laughs> As always, my sign off is going to be, I love this movie. I'm so happy I got to talk about it with you guys. It's really just always such a <laughs> great thing. Uh, if I can gush, just being able to talk about these movies I like a lot um, in sort of a semi-structured, formal manner with friends. Uh, and this one in particular is such, a, it strikes such a nerve with me um, on an emotional level, even, even more than those films where I feel like I close every podcast I host with, I love this movie, it's so good. Um, but this one in particular, is so, so near and dear to my heart on such an emotional level. It, it informs so much of me, and I'm so happy I got to share it with you guys uh, more than anything. That's always such a joy. But uh, thank you uh, for joining us, viewers at home. If you enjoyed our episode on The Last Unicorn, uh, I invite you to click that like button, give us a subscribe if you particularly like us, and hit the bell icon if and you'd like. Uh, what are your thoughts on the film? Uh, do you have a particular favorite character, a favorite line? God, the film's so quotable. Um, preference, novel or film, or do you think that they're companions and work together very well, which is the correct opinion? <laughs> yeah, let us know. Um, and if you're listening on Spotify or any of the other uh, podcatcher services, you probably can't leave us a comment unless it's like uh, app, Apple podcast, in which case leave us a positive review uh, and put your comment in there too, because I think if you do text things. It make it boosts you in the whatever algorithm. And if you're listening to Spotify video version, also don't leave a comment because I don't think you can do that. But definitely check out our Patreon um, where you can uh, give us a little bit of cash to continue talking about cool things and funding our wonderful editor, Austin, and other content creators and interim substitute editors, Tim. Both incredible talents. And that's, that's enough with the plugs. Join us next week for our lovely sometimes substitute editor, oftentimes host, horror and anime fan, Tim, as he hosts Perfect Blue, the 1997 Satoshi Kon classic. And remember, there never is a happy ending because nothing ever ends. Take care. Farewell. Have a taco. I took it across the table and I said, sorry guys, I gotta see about a girl.